Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to another Brew and Orange podcast. This is episode number 14. Um, it's a loaded episode. I got three pages here. Um, of course, I'm going to leave some of this for Justin on Friday because there's a lot to cover here. A lot of stuff has happened with the Lightning. A lot of stuff has happened with the Rays, obviously, if you watched last night. So I'm going to go ahead and hold off on all that, but we're going to cover so much today. I'm really excited. I got one person on. I appreciate that. So um, like we do every Brew and Orange podcast, let's go ahead and try a delicious beer. And tonight it's right here from the Tampa Bay area. It is from 81 Bay Brewery. Uh, this is located over off of Gandy Boulevard. Um, so check out this can art. It is top notch without a shadow of a doubt. I don't know what those are. Pokemon looking fish, but no, I'm just kidding. But look at that beautiful can art right there. And let's give it credit to label art by Jamie Jones. So great job. Great can. So I've never had this one before. I know a couple episodes ago, um, I've kind of reviewed some beers that I've had, but um, as you'll also see, I'll change my opinion sometimes. And that happens sometimes. I realized the last beer, I didn't give them enough credit. So I went ahead and changed that. So today we've got the Drink Local shirt. There it is, because that's what it's all about. That's what we, that's what we really want to do here. Um, and I got the special cup with the streets right there of the Tampa Bay area. So it doesn't get much local, more Tampa than that. Um, here we go. 8-1 Bay Charter 7. This is the IPA series. Charter 7. Dry hopped with Citra and Callista hops. So here we go. Cheers, everybody. I hope everyone had, hope everyone had a great day. Wednesday, it is hump day. It's all downhill to the weekend, Memorial Day weekend. That's an extended weekend for the majority of us. If not, you know, enjoy your, your regular weekend. So, like always, let's go ahead and pour this bad boy up. 8-1 Bay Brewery, and this is Charter 7 IPA Series. Let's get that pour. Just like we like all of our hazy IPAs, look at that color. Very nice. Good pour. Can't wait to try this first time. Remember, find my untapped at Brew and Orange. Uh, so Brew and Orange on untapped. You'll see the over 700 rankings or ratings I did. I hope that you'll review my ratings. You know, cool, that's my opinion, but go try them yourself. Log in untapped, shout it out, let everybody know. So here we go. Cheers, everybody, on a Wednesday. Look at that color. That is nice. Drink local, 81 Bay Brewery. Uh, can't wait to tell you about everything going on. Cheers. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Hope everyone had a good work day. Gets home safe. Oh, that's very good. That's very, very good. So, sorry, there's a fly flying around me. Uh, 7.5 ABV does not drink like a 7.5 ABV. I don't know if that's just because I genuinely like hazy IPAs. Um, but that is, ooh, let's see. I'm willing to bet if Justin tries this, and that's, the, that's my buddy who's on here on Fridays, and I'm starting to learn his taste of beers even more. If he tried this, he's giving this a 375 tops. I'm giving this a 425. This is very, very, very good. I don't know if that's because I'm excited to tell you about the Ron Zook interview or if it's because the Lightning got past round two um, or that the 2022 recruiting um, kind of – time period that uh, it's going to pick up heavy right now. I'm just excited. So again, cheers. This is a 4.25. I'm going to put it on untapped right now. So again, cheers. Awesome. So here we go. 4.25. Check it out on untapped brew and orange. Check this out for yourself. Go check out the brewery. I'm going to go this weekend. I've actually never been. They've got stuff like bingo, open mic, trivia, yoga and brew and bottomless mimosas. So it looks like a really awesome place. I think I even saw they had darts, cornhole, all that kind of stuff. So I can't wait to check it out. Um, recognize the face. If you see me out there, say what's up. I'll be out there with my wife this weekend probably. So, again, cheers to 81 Bay Brewery. Cheers to all my Tampa sports fans, craft beer lovers. I can't wait to get into this episode. Cheers. That's delicious. So easy 4.25 right there. Let's just real quick, let's look at what they, you know, the flavor profiles of this real quick, just in case you're curious of it. I always think it's interesting to see what what they say about the taste of these, because I'm no beer expert. I just think it tastes good. So citrusy, hoppy, sweet, piney light. Makes sense. 4.25, that's all that matters. Let's hop right into it. So 
Obviously, as everyone knows, Lightning went ahead and won. They got through the second round against the Boston Bruins. They're moving on, and they're awaiting the winner of the Flyers and the Islanders. Give me the Islanders. I think that's ultimately what's going to happen. Um, it is obvious the Lightning are the best team remaining in the NHL playoffs for many reasons, and here's three of them. Hedman, Point, Palat, if Kucherov comes back. So those are my three kind of, I don't know, three stars, three MVPs of the Lightning series. Had been point and plot, and for obvious reasons, you could add, you know, um, Maroon was good. Um, there, um, there's a guy, I can't remember his name right now. He was great. Um, but had been point plot for obvious reasons. Braden Point and Headman were both clutch in overtime. Plot had um, multi goal games all in a row. I think he scored goals two in a row. He had two goals one game, two assists the next. He was all over the place. Um, look, the Lightning continued to win in overtime. They, the power play has now become a strength. I mean, they were 0-14 in the power play at one point, and I think they scored three power play goals in the last two games. Obviously, that's a huge improvement, and it, it's obvious, it's um, kind of impressive considering Kucherov was out and we're missing Stamkos. Um, it's just this team is the best team remaining in the playoffs. I, Islanders are Flyers. I know that the Flyers beat the Lightning in the round robin, but that's different. That's then. This is now. I think the Lightning would have that advantage. Um Vassie is doing what Vassie has to do, and he's not even playing his best hockey. Um, as kind of enforced their will on Boston, even though that is what Boston did in uh, Game One. It was at, it was over after that. When the Lightning scored those seven goals, the, this series ultimately, in the long run, watching start to finish each of these games was not even close. It was all in favor of the Lightning. I just think that's. Um, I'd say that was obvious, and it was just great to see them put it away. You'd like to see them get these games over before overtime, but, hey, if we've got to be tired in the morning, that's just how it is. Um, while you're watching those overtime games, make sure you're drinking some Tampa Bay craft breweries, all right? So go go there, watch the games. I know they're staying open. I know Bay Cannon is always doing stuff. Hey, go to 8 One Bay and watch the game. Um, so after that, let's go ahead. So I did want to say, you know, Boston did have that. Like I said, Boston had that one good game. But overall, the Lightning were the were the team to beat the entire time. They imposed their will. It was fun to watch, stressful to watch. I know everyone's blood pressure was probably through the roof, but, man, that was a fun series. You love to see that they got over the Columbus Blue Jackets. Um, they got over that hump, and they were able to beat the Bruins. And the Bruins were the second-best team in the playoffs at that time. I don't think Dallas or Colorado is up there with the Bruins or the Lightning. So expect the Lightning to continue to play well. I'm not ready to give any sort of prediction for this Islander Flyers versus Lightning series. Let's, I'm going to watch the Flyers game um, and Flyers and Islanders tomorrow night. And hopefully when we see each other again on uh, Friday, we'll maybe have a resolution to that series and know who the Lightning are playing. So now fun point thing. Let's go right into the race. Let's talk about the Rays. Everybody was talking about the Rays today. Um, 620 was just one of the best days for listening to Tampa Bay Sports Radio. Um, obviously, we saw what happened last night. Bench clearing brawl, you know, well, not a brawl, sorry. A, a, just a bench clear that happened between the two. It was obvious, in my opinion, that Chapman was throwing at Br Brousseau. Um, I don't – whatever you want to say – Yankees fan or not, you got to admit that that um, his demeanor coming off the mound after throwing that pitch was not of not of someone who is innocent. That was intentional. Um, the suspensions that were laid down, Chapman got I think one or two games, but also Boone and Cash. Um, I don't think anyone's going to retaliate tonight. <clears throat> I think the season's too short. I think the injury list for the Rays is too long. I don't see anyone retaliating in a way that we may have seen if this happened during a regular season. I mean, you've got, what, nine or ten pitchers for the Rays already on the injured reserve list. Um, Cash isn't going to, out of spite, do this. Hopefully the Rays, Kiermaier, all the guys who are healthy, ready to play, Adamas, Yoshi, Choi, I hope they come together. I hope they're angry tonight. I hope they take their emotions up on the Yankees on the field with a big win. Score those 12 runs like you did against the Marlins. That's ultimately how you shut a team up like the Yankees, okay? Um, Glass now looked great, I mean, the other night. Uh, he's got he's two and one with a, with a four four zero ERA right now. It doesn't seem that way because he does have outings like he just did the other day. It's hard to realize he's got that over four ERA. Um, the Aces are catching fire. Look, Snell for for how he came out last year, um, the injuries we have. It's great to see Snell doing well. He's got a three point one four ERA right now. He's three and zero on the season. Um, 
I think tonight's a must win for the Rays, not because it's going to dictate if they get into the playoffs or not. Subconsciously, psychologically, this is a big game. It's the last game of the regular season against the Yankees. Of course, you'll see them again in the playoffs more than likely. At least that's how it's looking. Got to win this game. I mean, the Rays have been hit by 19 pitches against the Yankees since 2018. Okay, so I think there's something up here or the Yankees – are allergic to pitching strikes and not hitting raised batters when they play each other. So take it how you will. I'm open for any comments. Email us at brewandorange at yahoo.com. If you have any comments that after the fact, however, you want to yell at me, you want to agree with me, that's cool. Um, look, Rays are going to win tonight. Shut them up hard. You know, the quote, remember the Titans, come on, get out there. And the Yankees have an attitude, a superiority complex. They're, they're elitist. They spend loads and loads of money on their roster and to have a bottom a bottom ranked team in team salary beating you whooping up on you taking the whole season series from you regardless of the outcome of tonight's game that gets under their skin you can tell and then you can't blame them where they're men it's competition it's major league baseball they go back this has been a long a long time rivalry however throw the ball 101 mile an hour at someone's head is not the answer so Rays have got to beat them tonight. That's all there is to it. I can't wait to watch this game. This is all eyes are going to be on the Yankees and Rays tonight, guaranteed. So that covers the light and it covers the Rays. Let me get a sip of this. We're going to talk. Leonard Fournette, you got traded. And I just got a CBS update that says Leonard Fournette and the Bucks are actively in conversation. Obviously, when Bruce Aarons was asked about it uh, during the week, earlier this week, he was coy. He was shy. He was bashful. He did, but he didn't say no. He said, we'll see how everything fits out. And guess what? It looks like it may fit very well because they're already talking. So I'm all for it. I don't know what they're going to do with McCoy. Uh, but Rojo was obviously injured during the scrimmage. You don't want to go into a situation uh, where you have the veteran McCoy back there who may not be game ready. He obviously has not gotten a lot of playing time the last few years. You need to pick somebody else up, even if that means cutting ways of McCoy at this point. So Fournette is obviously someone who is being talked about. So I think that's exciting. I mean, I think he could be a 1,000-yard uh, rusher if he's behind a good offensive line, and obviously he can catch the ball out of the backfield. That is probably what's drawing the Bucks to him the most because that is what they were expecting of whoever was starting at running back for the Bucks in the first place because that's Tom Brady's bread and butter right there. So here we go. All right, so y'all know I love to cover – uh, recruiting, obviously. So Tuesday night at midnight, it was official that the Florida staff could reach out effective at midnight that day, reach out to 2022 targets. Um, high school recruits, it was on. I mean, you should have seen the Twitter was going wild with the edits that all these teams were sending to the top prospects. One prospect said that he woke up in the middle of the night with his phone going just berserk. Um, I think that was – Jaheim Singletary, he's a five-star quarterback. Everybody wants him. Big boy battle, Florida. Florida probably has the edge. They've been working him the longest right now. But you got to imagine what that must be like for these young kids going into their senior years um, of high school football, especially with everything going on. So I think let's talk about a couple of guys who I think are going to be named that you're going to hear throughout the entire 2022 recruiting, uh, recruiting process. Um, Sam McCall and Jaheim Singletary. Sam McCall and Singletary are both Tampa – or both, sorry, not Tampa, Florida prospects of the state of Florida. They're guys you have to keep in state. Um, the guys like Tim Smith, Bowman, um, and Sanders, those are the guys who are program changers. You keep them in state. You don't let the out-of-state big boys come in and kind of pick your pocket of that top talent. McCall and Singletary are two guys who must be – you, you build the fence around the state. You don't let the Kirby Smarts, the Ryan Daves, uh, the Dabo Sweeties, and the Nick Havens come in, and even the uh, even the LSU. You don't let them come in and take guys like McCall and Singletary. Mullen is yet um, to do that, really. His one – you know, we only had Gervin Dexter of this past class as the number one recruit in the state. Before that, it was Martez Ivy. I mean, you've got to go even further back than that. There's a lot of really cool information I actually got um, I was going through the rankings. So this year, there are three five stars um, in the initial rankings for 2022 from the state of Florida. Now let's compare that with some other um, with some other years. Let's see here. All right, so three five stars in the state um, before. So there's ten top 100 
prospects from the state of Florida in the initial 2022 of 247 rankings. Um, okay, so three five stars this year. Let's go back to 2020. No, sorry, 2022. That's three five stars. 2021 is six. 2020 is four. 2019 is three. You had six five stars that year. So look, I went back about five or six years. The average number of five stars from the state of Florida that start off in those rankings and or have ended there, it's about four to five. That's a great number. It just shows you how talent rich the state of Florida is. And in my Ron Zook interview, you're going to see he wholeheartedly agrees. Um, unsolicited. He started talking about recruiting. I can't wait for you to hear that. Um, but he just talks about that. He actually expounds on you have to build this fence around here. You've got to keep the top talent in the state of Florida. If your programs like Florida, Florida state and Miami, that's gotta be your priority recruiting the state of Florida. And I think watch that interview. If you're watching, you're going to have to stay on afterwards, go on the anchor and listen to it. Okay. Um, he is really interesting stuff about his time with Steve Spurrier, really awesome stuff about his time coaching at Florida, recruiting guys like Chris Leak. really awesome guy. I was so glad to have him on. Anyways, I digress. So pretty much the state of Florida is talent rich. Florida's got to keep them in the state. Um, we're going to have like an in-depth analysis. I'll get more into how many players from the state of Florida are defense, how many of them are offense. You know, the, the, st the stuff that matters, the stuff that I know I'm interested in and I hope you are because I'm going to tell you all about it. So interesting little thing came out the other day. The Gators in Oklahoma are tied for fourth best odds to win the national championship th this year. And that of course omits the big 10 and Pac 12 schools. That may be where they would have been before, maybe slightly less because Ohio state may be above them. Penn state, depending on what ranking service you're looking at uh, has been ahead of Florida in a few, but that's generally where you would expect them to be in terms of odds to win the college football playoff. Um, I'm not mad about that. I doesn't mean anything at this point uh, because Florida I believe he's going to have a great season. I mean, I think the odds should be a little higher, in my opinion. So here we go. What we have now, we did officially get some times for three of the first four games for the Gators. The Texas A&M game has not been announced because they anticipate that game being a, a huge prime time, probably ESPN game, a night game, you know, that kind of thing. So they have not released that time, um, time schedule yet. However, at Ole Miss on the 26th is at noon. The following week, home game against South Carolina at noon. Two noon games in a row. Gator fans, I know that always makes us nervous. Let's hope that everyone's amped up to get back on the field and we don't have these noon blues that we've shown against teams like Vanderbilt and Kentucky. Let's put Ole Miss away and start the season off right. We're actually going to get into a huge breakdown right now about that game. <clears throat> Again, I got down this rabbit hole. I wanted to know who was coming back for Ole Miss. What's their projected depth chart? What does the talent look like on these teams? Um, and I did. I did just that. So if you're wondering, let's do our first Ole Miss versus Florida breakdown. It's the first breakdown of the season. Um, my dog's going crazy. Sorry about that. So what I looked at first, I wanted to know what their skill position looks like. Right now, they're wide receivers. So let's talk about Florida's DBs versus their tight ends, wide receivers, or pass catchers, the running back, that kind of thing. Florida has the advantage. There is absolutely no question about that. Wilson and Elam will lock down their receivers. They bring back one receiver with a lot of experience. One was injured last year. Um, these are young guys mostly, um, and Florida should not have any trouble matching up with them talent-wise and experience-wise. First game, I'm saying there's an interception or two. There's no, no way around it. Florida's D-line. Um, versus Ole Miss's O-line, that's a no-brainer. Um, Florida's D-line should eat that day. Multiple sacks. I'm talking I'm talking the first game of last season against Miami sacks, okay? Because this D-line is poised to do something really big this year. I would definitely look for two, let's call it my over and under. I'll go over four sacks for the day, and, two, and I'll go over two interceptions. So there's your bold prediction of that first game. Um, let me know what you think. If that's bold, you know, if you're watching this later, let me know. Let me know what you think. So here we go. D-line versus the O-line. Florida's D-line versus Ole Miss O-line. Uh, Florida's is going to win that every time. They have one senior on the line starting right now and two freshmen. That Two freshmen about to get their first start against Britton Cox, Jeremiah Moon, um, Kyrie Campbell, Tadaryl Slayton. If he's not winning that battle, you got to feel bad for the kid. 
Um, Florida's D line, um, like I said, Miami type numbers in terms of sacks and quarterback rushes. Remember, they were all in Jared Williams' face. He had no time to do anything. So let's talk about the running back position. Ole Miss returns 1,200 yards of their from their running back position last year, which you got to think that's probably one of the more experienced uh, backs uh, backfields in the in in, in the college, back, college football right now. They're not going to be productive against the O line. Like I said, if they're putting pressure on the quarterback for Ole Miss, which is Plumlee or Corral. Plumlee, he can get out. He can stretch the pocket. He can stretch the – he can extend plays with his legs. You're going to have to watch him. And obviously we know as Florida fans, we've watched Florida struggle of running quarterbacks. So Plumlee is going to be their runner extending the plays with his legs, and Corral is a pocket passer. However, Corral, he is athletic as well. So – We'll see. It depends on what kind of um, Kiffin is known for using those dual threat quarterbacks. But I think he can get something out of both of these guys, but it doesn't matter. Florida is going to dominate this game, I believe. I just think there's too much talent right now and too much to prove for this Florida team. So I do expect them to have a really, really good game coming up. So Kiffin did an interview today on the SEC Network. He was making excuse after excuse after excuse. It was actually kind of pathetic, to be totally honest with you. Now, like I said, Kiffin and Mullen right now have the same tone. If you watch a Dan Mullen interview um, of him, do it, watch his Zoom meetings, he too talks a lot about the lack of time to get continuity and to develop these players the way that Dan Mullen likes to. Those are coming from two different sides of the fence right there, and, and I think everyone can agree with me. Kiffin does have a point, though, like I said, Teams that lost personnel, teams that are replacing starters and um, you know, and just really experienced players in very important positions are going to have a hard time transitioning into the season with missing so much spring practice. I think that's, I think that's a given. That's you know, that's a, a, it's going to happen to everybody. And we're already seeing teams, NFL and college football, go down with injuries. People are opting out. This is going to be very interesting to see with these big teams like the LSU's, the Georgias. Teams that left who lost both both personnel and big time starters to the NFL draft, opt outs, injuries, that sort of thing. So, no excuses, Lane Kiffin. Okay, we're all playing under the same uh, these same conditions right now, but I understand in context it is different. And I think Florida is going to benefit from this. They have to stay healthy, but I think they benefit in the long run in a way that some teams definitely are not going to benefit. So, obviously, what we did see. Breaking news on SEC Network. It's on ESPN. It's everywhere. It took over the Paul Feinbaum show earlier I was watching. Um, Jamie Newman opted out. You know, the guy who already won the offseason Heisman. Everyone was crowning him already. Crown him if you want to. No, we're not crowning him because he's not playing. He opted out. So that's huge. The thing is, is you just hear these conflicting reports about JT Daniels. One minute, um, he's he's practicing. He's, during, he's in the scrimmage. However, he's not cleared to play. So what does that mean in the grand scheme of things? Do they have a plan? Are they hiding? Are we expecting, you know, any minute now we're going to get a notification that JT Daniels is now um, cleared to play? And all that's going to do is feed the fire that Jamie Newman left because he can prepare for the draft. He's not – they they have him highly rated. However, he did, he's not going to show it off. It's all going to be at the combine and that sort of thing. But maybe he was losing that job to JT Daniels. Maybe behind the scenes everyone knows he's already going to be cleared and George is playing it close to the vest. You just never know with these sort of things. So, man, we are flying through this thing in 23 minutes. That is awesome. All right, let me take another sip. I hope everyone – really, I just hope everyone has a good rest of the week. I mean, it's long weekend, Labor Day weekend. Everyone have fun. It's gonna If you're in the Tampa Bay area and you're watching this, it's going to be nice weather. Whatever that means, that means something different for us than other places. So, let's see here. All right, moving off to now. Conflicting views about uh, how he's doing in practice. One minute. Uh, so Bruce Feldman puts out a tweet and he says, source is Jamie Newman was on fire in practice, was excelling in practice, was learning the playbook very well. And then all of a sudden you go onto Georgia boards. Yes, I'll pop over from time to time just to check it out. Um, I'm not someone who goes and trolls, but I do like to read that and get that insight, bring it to y'all. They're saying Jamie Newman was struggling in practice. So you never know who to believe. Bruce Feldman, the 247 board, the mods, the insiders, you never know. Um, look, Jamar Chase opted out as well. There's possibly more to come from LSU. You just never know. Um, but you have to respect these players' decisions. It's a big decision. So 
you know, I think there's going to be a season regardless. Um, the direction seems to be going in that way. And we'll see what happens with the Big Ten. There's a lot of reports coming out right now that maybe, just maybe, they start in October. I know there's a target date in October. I think they said the 10th. We'll see. Um, but if it's not that date, it's never. And they'll have to wait till 2021. And there's going to be a lot of upset people if the SEC, the ACC, the AAC, and the Big 12 are playing, and the Big Ten and Pac-12 are just sitting at home not playing while Justin Fields on the couch and, you know, watching Trevor Lawrence probably win the Heisman. So I think we're going to see a lot of stuff happening here in the next couple weeks. I mean, it's September 2nd now. Um, shoot, here at Tampa, USF is supposed to have a game against the Citadel on the 12th, I believe, and then you have Notre Dame on the 19th. Football's around the corner, ladies and gentlemen. Go visit your local breweries, your local small businesses, your the restaurants, put the money back into the economy, watch some of the sports that are on TV, the Stanley Cup playoffs, the – uh, PGA Tour playoffs are coming to an end this week. I can't wait to watch that. If you if you don't know, I love golf. Love to go golf. Love to watch golf. But while you're doing it, drink your beers from the local breweries. Come on, get out there. Get to Eight One Bay. Get some Charter Seven IPA series. Um, I think they have the number six on tap there. So this weekend when I go, I'll be sure to try that. Maybe I'll get on Instagram Live and shout that out. Let y'all know how it is. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Look, if you're watching right now. Um, then you're going to need to go to Anchor, Spotify, and you're going to need to listen to the full episode. And if you're listening, um, we're about to interview Ron Zook. It, you know, I'm about to give you the interview. I didn't go into much detail because I want you to listen. He was a great interview. He expounded on everything that I asked him. And if you're a Gator fan, you're going to love what he has to say about recruiting. You're going to love to hear what he has to say about his time coaching under Steve Spurrier in 1991. Uh, through 93 and you're going to love to hear what he had to say about being a coach at Florida. He believes in the product. He believes in the brand. He's an awesome guy. Uh, so shout out to all my friends um, and my wife and, you know, Michaela Hunter, Amanda, all of y'all for being involved in this um, and helping this be possible. So again, um, everyone have a great rest of your week. Happy Wednesday downhill to the weekend. Have a nice long weekend. We're going to, I don't even know why I'm saying that because I'm going to see y'all again on Friday with some stuff. I'll have Justin here. Maybe we'll have our buddy Ricky Schaefer. He's a big-time Bucks fan, biggest Bucks fan I know. I know he's knowledgeable. Um, it's going to be – we're going to have a lot to talk about on Friday, and I can't wait to talk with you all. I'll have a new brewery to shout out and a new beer to try from said brewery. So, again, 8-1 Bay Brewing Company over off of Gandhi here in Tampa, Florida, charter number seven from the IPA series, charter number seven. So I'm going to finish this up. Enjoy the rest of my Wednesday. Everyone have a good uh, have a good Thursday, and I'll see you on Friday. Cheers. Go Gators. Go Bolts. Go Rays. Cheers, everyone in Tampa.